We're talking about Eric Massa 24-7 on the TV. We're talking about war and peace, $3 billion, a 1,000 lives, and no press. No press. You want to know why the American public is fit? They're fit because they're not seeing their Congress do the work that they're sent to do. It's because the press, the press of the United States is not covering the most significant issue of national importance, and that's the laying of lives down in the nation for the service of our country is despicable, the national press corps right now. Seven years after the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, is Representative Kennedy Wright with me to talk about it on this anniversary week. Christian Parenti, longtime correspondent for The Nation magazine. He's worked in Iraq, Afghanistan, you name it. Welcome back to Grid TV. Thank you very much. Sobering to hear what the representative said there, right? It's true, yeah. I mean, in large part, I think he's talking about the majority of the U.S. press corps, particularly television. There are plenty of journalists writing um, from, you know, trying, trying to write about these wars, and there are still papers uh, devoting attention to them. But by and large, you know, the, the broadcast media, present company excluded, is, is not. Let's talk about what's happened in Iraq, and then we'll go on to Afghanistan. But there were elections this week that came back with a surprise success for the most nationalist, in a sense, of the parties, Muqtada al sadas party. Talk about the significance of that and why you think it's happened. I think one thing to remember about the elections is that the whole political structure was not delivered by the occupation. The U.S. Not, did not decide that this parliamentary system would be the one Iraqis would have. The Iraqis, particularly the Shia, demanded elections in January of 2004. Paul Bremer, then in charge of the occupation, did not want to have an elected government. That was forced upon the U.S. occupation. And uh, we see now in this election a return of Iraqi nationalism, which seems to have been killed along with tens of thousands of people in the sectarian bloodletting, which has not ended by any means, but was at its height in 2006, 2007. And um, that, is, that is interesting and hopeful. I mean, the Iraqi political elites are, uh, by and large, do not have politics that I would share. But uh, in, in some ways, the fact that they're at first, there was accusations of vote fraud that seemed to be diminishing. There's going to be some sort of coalition government that the Sunnis have come back into the political process, that secular forces along with Shia nationalist forces have taken these elections seriously and will have a voice in this government is a good thing. Is part of the U.S. confusion, the U.S. media's confusion about this story, and maybe the public's too, the fact that the two things you've just described are kind of in conflict? On the one, we want to have, quote, unquote, helped launch a democracy, and on the other hand, we kind of wish it had different values. Yeah, I suppose. And also, I think that the U.S. left, to some extent, can't really, doesn't like to deal with contradictions and, and prefers a morally clear story. And uh, the story of Iraqi nationalism and the way in which Iraqi political elites sort of are oppressed by the, the occupation, but then also use it and play Iran off against the U.S. and navigate, you know, their own national interest is too complicated mm. um, sometimes for, for our progressive press corps to really get into. And then the right, of course, just wants to tell the fairy tale of, of U.S. democracy spread by force of arms. Well, the fairy tale teller uh, extraordinaire out there is uh, Karl Rove. He was in the press again this week with his new book. Here's a clip from what he had to say this weekend. There was also sharp criticism and justified from a lot of quarters of the management of the war. Once you did go to war, the insurgency was more swiftly activated on the part of those Islamics who wanted to fight back. We were not greeted as liberators beyond the first couple of days. We didn't have enough troops to provide internal security. The cost of the war skyrocketed almost from the beginning. There was not a sharing of the oil revenue that a lot of people had promised, including the, the vice president. I, I, let me correct you. There, you put it down a lot of things there. I'd be happy to deal with them serially or together, whichever you like. But, for example, on that one, the administration emphatically said this was not about oil. Not about oil? Uh, I, I think it was about oil and about the geostrategic importance of oil. Um, the, Europe and, and particularly the rising powers of India and China are more dependent on Middle Eastern oil than the U.S. is. So for the U.S. to place its military as the sort of gendarme that, that, that guards oil creates a dependency on the U.S. in the global system. Um, the, you know, Iraq did not end up privatizing its oil completely and giving it all to U.S. firms. The entrance of private firms into Iraqi oil 
has, been, has gone more to European firms. And um, Iraq has maintained fundamental like, control and ownership over its oil resources. Its oil economy is, is severely damaged, and it has plenty of capital to invest in that, $70 billion by some counts of surplus to invest in that. But it does need um, expertise. A lot of, you know, there's been a serious brain drain from this war and even before. So there is some reason to, to, to have relationships with foreign companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they've gone beyond that. But the oil law was not just a complete sellout and giving it all to ExxonMobil. Switching to talk about other relationships and the U.S. relationship with Pakistan, what did you make of um, the arrest recently by Pakistani authorities of the second most highly placed commander of the Taliban? It's been presented as a great example of Pakistan-U.S. collaboration. Well, it, uh, uh, it came out at first. What, what's, I mean, the facts have revealed themselves, which are that Karzai was angry about it. Karzai was, through the Saudis, in negotiation, and the UN was involved in this to some extent, in negotiation with elements of the Taliban. Um, Ghani Bardari, I think was his name, the number two who was arrested, uh, the, the, the Pakistanis arrested him, and they championed, they said this is you know, evidence of our new cooperation in the war on terror. In fact, this was an attempt to undermine Karzai's efforts to build an, a negotiated peace. You know, and, and according to those closer to the source reporting, the Taliban saw opening negotiations with Karzai as a way to get to negotiations with the U.S. and as a way to end the war. And that is the only way that the war can end, uh, that or, or some sort of horrible repetition of what happened in the early 90s with the, the final collapse of some sort of officially foreign-backed government that doesn't really have any backing and then... And then um, so this war. great act of collaboration was more an act of sabotage? It was an act of sabotage by Pakistan, which has for years been playing a double game. It, it sees Afghanistan as a proxy war in its struggle with India, it's, so too in Kashmir. And many of the same characters transit from the Kashmiri front into Afghanistan. And ever since the anti-Soviet jihad, Pakistani intelligence has had deep connections to the Taliban or people who are now the Taliban and has used them to weaken Afghanistan because in its simplest terms, they do not want at their back Afghanistan, a pro-Indian state that is strong and stable and has an army and a functioning economy. Do you think the U.S. is even beginning to get it? Um, supposedly, according to Ahmed Rashid, there are debates in the um, Obama administration as to whether or not they should negotiate with the Taliban. So. Maybe they're beginning to get it, but they don't get it yet. And Christian Parenta, you can find his reporting at The Nation magazine and in The Nation magazine's website. We've got a link at our site. He was also field producer and is featured in the film that's out there that is called Fixer, The Taking of Akbal Nashbani. More information at our site, grittv.org.